So thank you everyone for showing up again for another week's lecture of the Rising Tide Foundation lecture series on the art of statecraft. Um, many of you, I think, have already listened to at least a few of these in this current series, which we have broken down into sort of four movements, each tackling a different period of universal history. The idea is that there is a unifying theme tying every single portion together. Each, each movement has three sections. And, uh, what? and each of the sections is governed by the idea that there has been one unifying pr process for universal history, not just in the West, but in the East as well, as well as in the North and the South and all parts of the world and all cultures have been defined by uh, two opposing tendencies, one of which defines the one as a whole, which is a sum of parts to be managed uh, by an elite um, according to certain rules, fixed assumed rules of a game. Um, the other one defines a whole, the one that is humanity, as being more than the sum of its parts in because human beings, this, this uh, philosophy, this, this movement which has expressed itself in the form of what we've seen from uh, Confucius's networks in ancient China to Plato's networks in ancient Greece, um, throughout the Renaissance periods of many cultures, we've seen this other group sees that human beings are more than the sum of their parts because we have certain qualities that you can't define materially in space or time. Concepts like justice, love, virtue. Um, these are things which allow for when we, we give our loves to those, um, I guess you could say eternal qualities, they're not susceptible to decay we can enhance and awaken potentials within ourselves that allow for creative leaps that one could not make if you think of yourself as sort of just a robot uh, acting on utilitarian or sensual impulses to, to that define your, your formation of your identity, your judgments of how you're going to use your life uh, moment to moment. So it's, it's, a, it's a qualitatively different orientation and the idea of law of statecraft, but also of political economy. Um, there, there might be similar words used from people who represent either oppo opposing philosophy, but the meaning behind the words are very different and the effects of them are also very different. So last week and the week before, we've, been, we've begun an exploration of the period uh, of the Renaissance in the West. Um, Nancy Spanis, many of you have listened to some of the, the wonderful presentations she's given uh, for the Rising Tide Foundation in the past. Um, she's devoted really her entire mature life to the rediscovery and activation of these principles that were most clearly expressed in the form of Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, his mentor, in what used to be known more broadly as the American system of political economy. Um, today, that's not very well understood anymore. It's largely been scrubbed out uh, and made very ambiguous in the history books. Um, Nancy, back in the 1970s, was one of the first people, I think, in the modern era who was able to really pull together uh, a resource book um, called the, I think it's the, forgive me, Nancy, if I'm getting the name wrong, the his, the Roots we of the American the System. Pair of political book. Political Economy of the American Revolution. We the called it the Pair Book. Okay, the Political Economy of the American Revolution. And this is a wonderful book featuring a lot of the original writings of great thinkers, economists, statesmen who gave birth to a process known as Cameralism. Again, something which you may not know much about as a word, but you're going to by the end of this lecture. Um, uh, one among of the, these groups is somebody who many of us here in this group uh, might already know of Gottfried Leibniz, who uh, we've been reading his discourses on metaphysics every week um, with our reading group. And he's known famously as a scientist, a leading scientist, but he's so much more than that. And, um, and Nancy is going to, she's, I'm probably done more work on this figure than many people that I know, probably anybody that I know. Uh, so I'm very excited to uh, listen to another side of Leibniz that many people will, I think, be very, very happy about. And uh, we're going to open for questions when the main lecture is done. And Nancy, you'll just, when you, when you have to leave, you let us know. And uh, like usual, keep, put your names in the chat area and I'll call upon you in queue accordingly. So Nancy. It's all yours. Okay, well, first I wanna thank Matt for asking me to do this because uh, my work on cameralism was uh, probably peaked in the late 70s. <laughs> um, because, and I have really haven't been working on it that much uh, 
gone back to look at it that much since that time, but I used the occasion in preparing for this presentation uh, to reacquaint myself with some things and maybe even rethink a few things. Um, the, there is in the second edition of the pair book an introduction which gives a summary of my understanding of cameralism going into the American Revolution at that time. So if you have access to that book, I think it's still available uh, on Amazon, then uh, you can also see that. So I've prepared a, a slide presentation. Um, so um, cameralism, Gottfried Leibniz and the American system. Um, the, what we're talking about is the standpoint from which I approached this was the roots of looking for the European roots of the thinking of the leading political economist of the American Revolution, primarily that being uh, Alexander Hamilton. And the key figure in that transmission was Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz is significant to us in this presentation from two standpoints. He is the heir of an earlier cameralist tradition, uh, which I'm going to give you some uh, very interesting information about. Um, he lived, as probably many of you know, 1646 to 1716. So he's the heir to a prior tradition, and he is a bridge to thinking in the United States and also many other nations. Um, Russia, uh, France, uh, and so forth. So uh, he is the key guy, but he also, but he is not sui generis. Uh, he's coming from a tradition uh, which began effectively uh, with the Renaissance. And I'm sorry I didn't get to the other classes, but that's. Uh, I think coherent with what you've been discussing. And from him forward, I would say the major figures were that reflected Leibniz's outlook as a political economist uh, or statesman. Um, you have Benjamin Franklin, definitely shared his optimism, scientific and political. Um, and his creativity in all areas. They actually called Leibniz a polymath, right? Um, someone who is, goes from, the, uh, from science to law. He had a law degree, uh, philosopher uh, and diplomat uh, and political economist, inventor, and many of those things you could say the same about Franklin. And from Franklin uh, further to Alexander Hamilton, who, as you know, has been my focus of attention in studying the uh, economic basis, the political economy of the American Revolution uh, and our founding, the founding of the United States. So, and I will show you how those influences uh, helped shape Hamilton's thinking. And I will also give you a picture of the, where you will see the reflections of that earlier thinking in what Hamilton himself proposed. So we start off with what was cameralism. Now, literally, of course, as many of you would guess, camera means room. <laughs> this was a room where the, uh, of advisors for the ruling monarchs or the ruling princes. Uh, so we're dealing with a, uh, uh, a cabinet of advisors. Um, but this, they had a certain kind of outlook. And that outlook was heavily uh, shaped by the Renaissance, uh, the ideas, the resurgence of cultural uh, commitment 
to the creativity of the human individual in terms of science, in terms of art, uh, and in terms of governing, uh, that there was no separate moral principle uh, that governed each of these. There was a unifying principle. Um, and effectively, the what you were getting in the, in the camera that reflected uh, this kind of thinking was a science of good government. Uh, this fresco is part of a, uh, is just one wall in the city hall of Siena, um, which was the, another one is, so this is to reflect all the economic activity that was being promoted by a wise ruler. Uh, so that you, so you see the marketplace, uh, you see the discussions. Uh, one of the other walls had the countryside flourishing. And then uh, on the darkest side, you had uh, the evil, uh, where you had bad government. Uh, and how that was the source of wars, pestilence, and all kinds of other problems. So this it's from this concept that you begin to uh, get an idea of linking governing with certain principles of the economy, uh, that they're not separate. Uh, and I would hazard a summary from the readings that I've done, and fortunately I've done a bit more uh, since I've done in the 70s now, um, to uh, would summarize in this way. Um, and if, if our reader wants to read these, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Please go ahead. <clears throat> the chief, I'm assuming I'm unmuted. Uh, the chief tenets of cameralism are to promote the welfare of the population, not the interests of the ruler. Uh, that welfare means ensuring the development of agriculture and industry. Uh, such productive development requires providing for education, freedoms, and happiness of the population. Population growth and development are the major source of wealth of the state, not bullion, minerals, and the like. In other words, man himself, created in the image of God, is the source of real wealth. So that is my summary uh, from reading particularly, um, well, a whole number of these cameralist thinkers. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, with people from Italy from Naples, in fact, Neapolitan school. Now, when you look up cameralism on the internet, they'll say, well, this was a German school, right? There's no, not much else went on anywhere else, but uh, that can't conceivably be true. <laughs> and it, it definitely was not true. And we are, so we're, I'm choosing a couple of the key thinkers from Italy uh, who dealt with the economic aspect, uh, both of whom are known to have become uh, influences later on in German thinking. Um, this fellow, Antonio Serra, was actually uh, cited very favorably by Friedrich List. Um, and uh, the next fellow I'm going to discuss uh, was also widely translated and publicized. Now, the thing about these guys from Naples, uh, Naples now was this, he's, this guy's writing, at, uh, is born at the end of the 16th century. No one knows exactly the date. No one knows exactly the date uh, when he died. Uh, but he was a chemist. Uh, he was an advisor. And he was a, apparently a conspirator with Tommaso Campanello, 
so he wrote this paper uh, from prison uh, in 1613. Um, and Naples at that time um, was one of the leading cities in Europe. Uh, it was controlled by the Spanish, uh, had been endowed with a lot of money for the arts. Uh, their overall political economy had, however, considerable lacks, which is one reason why Serra felt impelled uh, to write as he did. Now, his, this is the translation of his title, and I think you'll find it, I found it very interestingly provocative. You know, how, how can we make our kingdoms rich without having gold and silver, right? <laughs> so, you know, there has to be a source of wealth, uh, and that uh, is what Serra uh, decided to investigate. And he wrote some extremely uh, instructive principles on that basis. Let me start with, he in effect uh, divided those, the causes for wealth into two groups. One, the Occidenti Propri. I asked my son today, who is, lives in Italy and is totally uh, fluent in both, you know, how, whether I could call propri intrinsic, right? Uh, he said, yeah, you could. It's also nat almost natural, uh, natural causes. So looking at the situation of Naples and the economic problems it was having and, and trying to address this question in the, of how to create wealth and deal with those problems, he said, well, there, there are countries he compared Naples to other city-states and countries. And he said, well, there are some who have gold and silver mines, and that's how uh, they get rich. And these are intrinsic to where they live. Uh, there, some have incredibly fertile agricultural lands. And others, particularly Venice, he's talking about, uh, have a tremendously advantageous position for carrying out international trade. And this makes them, uh, gives them a source of wealth, uh, which we really don't have here down here in Naples. So, so what are the other sources? They are the Occidenti Comuni. Um, and I would call those the public causes or the uh, community causes. They're created by man, right? They're created by your culture. Uh, and uh, so that's your crafts and manufacturers, how you, how you treat and improve your population. That involves including the state of education. I mean, it was astounding to me exactly, going back to reading some of these people, of how important the idea of educating everyone was, uh, as opposed to what actually happened in the world. Um, and then um, the proper forms of governmental policy to have this happen. So these were very significant ideas. And I think you can, for example, also find them well reflected uh, in list. Um, where he's also talking about the significance of cultural policy from the government uh, as one of the actual determining factors in the wealth and development of the country. So the other fellow who is extremely important from Naples as a cameralist is Antonio Genovese. Uh, he actually was appointed to be the first chair of political economy in the world that is known. Um, and at this point, he comes into his active life uh, at the time when Charles III of Spain, who's confusingly known as Charles VII of Naples, <laughs> um, is 
uh, ruling, and he was a relatively uh, humanist prince, as I understand it from reading a long time ago. Um, and he was also investing a lot in cultural institutions, arts, sciences. I mean, there was some great, the Scarlatti's came from uh, Naples in this period. There was a lot of uh, tremendous culture that was developed there. Um, but they did not develop their economy as a whole. They didn't develop their agriculture, for example. So um, in 1764, there was a tremendous famine. Uh, and in 1765, Genovese writes his major uh, tract on political economy. Um, he, one of the images that's used about Naples at this time, which didn't come from Genovese, but I picked up from somewhere else, is uh, that Naples was a massive head with a shrunken body because the political economy was not developed. Um, so, and this book was also, Genovese's book was also widely translated uh, throughout the country, very, uh, very, throughout the world. Very interestingly, uh, there's, well, let me go through what he has to say and then, then make that comment. Uh, these are the key concepts that come from Genovese's writings. Um, he heavily introduces this concept of public happiness um, as a key political goal. And the idea is this, this is linked with virtue, as Matt mentioned before. Um, it's a direct counter to ideas such as those of Mandeville, which were also uh, fable of the bees, how, how everyone should pursue their evil interests and it will all turn out for the good. Total uh, opposite of that. He has a heavy emphasis on population growth. Um, and many of the people who write about him say, well, that's because they just had this famine and a huge depopulation. But it was much more substantial than that. Uh, his, he emphasizes the need to increase the population, but you can't just have more people. Uh, you have to be able to sustain those people uh, through your production. And uh, improving their conditions of life. He calls that level that that a just population. And I don't know exactly how that would work from the Italian translation, but it's the, the right population, you know, the right population size. Uh, but it's a relative population. That's what really struck me about this idea. Um, is that he's talking about populations relative to your productive base of your society, which uh, I found very intriguing. Um, and then he had a very strong emphasis on the need for internal trade, um, developing uh, the activity between your sectors of the economy um, internally, not relying on the princes coming in from abroad uh, in order to, uh, you know, to develop what you had and consequently to take all the wealth with them when they left. Um, interestingly, the, there's been something of a revival of study of these fellows, uh, particularly Genovese. Uh, one was from the University of California um, and, and another on the question of, in, of public virtue being critical to economy, uh, public happiness being critical to economy. Um, and the, I could give you, if anyone is interested after this, I have the titles of the articles that I read about this. Also, Sarah's work is translated into English. Um, the uh, Genovese's is not, uh, but should be. 
uh, clearly. The, my sense from what I've read of these fellows and about them is that you really have to contrast their concept of public happiness with the more popular idea of happiness indexes, which the World Bank and others are putting out today, where that's a feel good kind of happiness, right? Which is disconnected from the physical economy and the basis of supporting your uh, population and its future. Um, so, so these are leading thinkers that generally are omitted from studies of cameralism, which is, as I said, heavily German centered, um, but who had an international impact uh, in the 17th and 18th century. In Germany, however, that's where we go next. Um, one of the first leading cameralists, considered the father, is this Veit von Seckendorf. Um, he was a, he operated in Germany and Austria um, and in the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War. So once again, he's dealing with a disaster and looking for principles of political economy as to how you can uh, get your population out of total a totally devastating situation, uh, building up from nothing in, in many respects. Uh, of course, Germany was not Germany at that time. There was the uh, Austrian Empire and there were 300 mini cities, mini states in Germany or something like that. So um, he operated out of Gotha and Halle uh, in that lower Saxony part of Germany um, and was extremely influential. Uh, for those behind, those who followed him. He wrote these two major works, uh, let's see here, uh, Forstenstadt is the Prince of State, Christian Stadt. I mean, these people were all operating off the cons of the Christian Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance concept of man in the image of the creator and therefore being able to be creative toward their environment, their economy, uh, and their fellow man within obligations that they had uh, to uh, morality. So this guy had an incredible uh, listing of, of economic programs. Uh, as I said, he was sort of starting from scratch uh, in terms of the German territory being laid waste. Uh, but just some examples which we find moving forward uh, in history is again a big emphasis on education. Uh, the role of the state in ensuring that you're producing the necessities for the population to have a decent living standard, um, a regulation of prices, and abolishing usury. Um, all of those uh, clearly having a significant uh, importance for physical economy. Now, let's see. This is a quote from him. You want to read it, uh, Hugh? Of course. The happiness of the domestic stratum, or of each separate human being, regardless of accidental social status, is to be sought approximately in this, that one must have health, food, clothing, and other comforts and necessities of life. To this must be added, the common civil well-being, the freedom or right to associate with his own, to be thereby in appropriate respect or honor, also to enjoy peace and protection against wrong and violence. Surprisingly modern sounding to me. Um, now, the next 
major fellow, and I'm going to get back to him later because he's the closest thinker to Leibniz. Uh, and when I hit the Leibniz section, I want to go into what Becker had to say in more detail. Uh, but he is the next major figure uh, also operating between Austria and, um, and Germany. And uh, he also was a chemist, a, phys a physician. He was a physician to uh, Leopold I, I think, of Austria. Um, and, you know, played a, a major diplomatic role in spreading his ideas of political economy. And as I said, he's the, a very close link to Leibniz. I love this statue of Leibniz because it's the only picture I've seen of Leibniz without that horrible hair, right? Um, the, uh, I was so glad to see that there was such a thing. Um, Becker and Leibniz worked together uh, at the court of the Elector of Mainz, Germany. So, um, and there was clearly uh, a lot of influence in the ideas of Becker on Leibniz's thinking on political economy. And then the next uh, significant figure in this lineage of Cameralist political economy in the German speaking area, all this guy wrote in French, <laughs> uh, Emmerich de Vettel, he's from Switzerland, uh, which of course is, is French, German and Italian, um, is uh, Emmerich de Vettel, um, who wrote The Law of Nations, uh, also a major tract on political economy and a major uh, specific defender and proponent of Leibniz's ideas. Uh, his first major writing, uh, he mostly worked, he's from Switzerland, he mostly worked uh, for the courts in Germany and he was a, uh, his first major work, I think, was in 1741, uh, was in defense of Leibniz, probably on the scientific area, but also political and legal thinking, which he was specialized in. This guy is not a, a uh, physical scientist. As far as I know, he was primarily a lawyer, philosopher, and so forth. So let's get to Leibniz, which you probably were wondering when I would get to. Um, so, as I said, the Leibniz was born in Leipzig, educated as a lawyer, uh, and went into philosophy, and then decided he really wanted to get into a public service, I guess you'd call it. Um, and he became a advisor, part of the camera of the Elector of Mainz, uh, in particular, a fellow by the name of uh, Oineberg, who was uh, a lead advisor uh, to the Elector. This is, uh, so this took, brought Leibniz to Mainz. Uh, he, did a lot of work for him on legal questions and so forth. Um, but he also took the occasion to be able to, to study and expand his ideas um, on other social and economic political issues as well. And here you have the library. I love the fact these some of these libraries and buildings still exist in Europe, despite their horrible wars. Uh, this is, I happened to have the benefit of seeing this library when I was traveled there uh, in this uh, seven, in the 1970s. So um, wonderful library where he would have worked. Now, while working for the Elector of Mainz, uh, he came up with a proposal that involved France and they 
sent him to France. Uh, he was in France between 1772 and 17, no, six, 1672, get my centuries mixed up, 1672 and 1676. Uh, and when he was there, he effectively was part of the humanist academy system established by Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert, as probably many of you know, being many of you being Quebecois and so forth, um, you know, was working for Louis XIV, who was problematic to say the least, but he was determined to implement a policy to build France as a unified nation state based upon uh, the most advanced scientific ideas, national sovereignty, uh, and the like. And he assembled what today I suppose you would call a brains trust, I and mean, they called it a system of academies um, of great thinkers from all around the continent, including Huygens uh, and Leibniz. And it's here that uh, we believe that Leibniz wrote, became not only familiar with other leading scientists um, where, uh, and began to develop his calculus and other uh, major mathematical breakthroughs, but he's also where he got a real glimpse of and began to develop his ideas on political economy and good government. Uh, in uh, the cameraless tradition. So uh, those ideas, however, were also shaped by Becker, who was not in France, uh, but whom he had worked with in Mainz. And I want to give you some of the Becker quotes from Becker's major uh, paper. Uh, on political economy, which is called the political discourse. Uh, and again, we see this major emphasis on the question of happiness, but also some, you want to read, Hugh? Certainly. If, if people find that, don't find that useful, let me know and we won't read, but. It is easily recognized that all law and authority has its origin and its foundation in governing people well and giving them happiness. Both regents do evil beyond any measure who treat their subjects like cattle for their private benefit and do not care at all for the welfare of their subjects. These um, are more of his ideas. He has a harmony of interest idea, uh, but not a abstract one, but one based on the fact that he gets into the weeds, so to speak, on the question of what a society is producing, what raw materials it's producing, what crafts it has, what manufacturers it has, what its trade is, um, and what their connections must be. You know, if you need more iron workers, if you need more uh, other people to fit in what we would call the supply chain of economic uh, activity to provide for your population, very much into that uh, concreteness uh, as well as the general idea. And the general idea, um, Hugh? It is easily understood that just like someone who wants to play on a violin must first of all consider and tune each string. So, if the civil community is to have its secure nourishment, it must certainly take care of and consider all kinds of people within the community. And again, an emphasis on population uh, as, a, as the key asset uh, and source of strength uh, for a nation. The increase in population in and for itself is insufficient if there is no productive output there as well. I say productive output is the angle with which to attract people. For if they can live decently, they will come by and the more come, 
become, the more can reach other. And this is the other fundamental rule, namely, to increase the population of a state, one has to provide a decent living to them and productive output. So there we have, from there I transitioned to Leibniz per se. Now, you might ask, why am I doing so little, you know, Leibniz per se? Well, basically we're operating off two, made two documents of Leibniz's on political economy. Uh, they were both written while he was in uh, France, and we don't know the exact date. We believe they were, it was 1671, 1672. Um, he's approaching this study, of course, he's begun his philosophical studies and law studies and uh, mathematical studies long, phys physical studies long before this. Um, but he is again emphasizing the science, the connection between wisdom, knowledge, and the science of happiness. Um, and this is his uh, starting point. Um, I don't think we have to read that. But it informs the first paper, which is an extremely short paper. You can find it in the pair book. You um, can also find it in the Daily Magazine or probably other places. In the there. description uh, box of this video, it will be found. Okay, very good. Um, so these are quotes. Um, do you want them read or not? Find it useful? Yes, Either. please. Okay. Okay, go ahead. And why, indeed, should so many people be poor and miserable for the benefit of such a handful? After all, is not the entire purpose of society to release the artisan from his misery? Through establishment of such a society, we eliminate a deep-seated drawback within many republics which consists in allowing each and all to sustain themselves as they please, allowing one individual to become rich at the expense of a hundred others, or allowing him to collapse, dragging down with him the hundreds who have put themselves under his care. I find it so pointed. <laughs> These are quotes. Each country shall supply itself with those necessary commodities and manufactured goods which previously came from abroad, so that it will not have to procure from others what it can have for itself. Now here, I, I read overtones of Alexander Hamilton uh, and other uh, American system and uh, nationalist thinkers who say, you know, we're not going to anti-imperialist thinkers, let's put it that way, uh, who say, you know, we can't afford, we can't have a healthy society if we rely on being supplied uh, by the imperial power. And here, then he gets from, I mean, the whole framing of the short paper is against monopoly and abuses, but within it, he's providing certain guidelines for how a society should function. Um, and he's addressing arguments against what he would say, uh, which is providing uh, the wherewithal for people to, to live well. So this is also a quote. One might object that artisans today work out of necessity. If all their needs were satisfied, then they would do no work at all. I, however, maintain the contrary that they would be glad to do more than they do now out of necessity. For first of all, if a man is unsure of his sustenance, he has neither the heart nor the spirit for anything, will only produce as much as he expects to sell, concerns himself with trivialities, and does not have the heart to undertake anything new and important. He thus earns little, must often drink to excess, merely in order to dull his own sense of desperation and drown his sorrows, and is tormented by the malice of his journeyman. So that's from that. 
Then we have the other paper, which is much more lengthy. Uh, and this is called On the Establishment of Society in Germany for the Promotion of the Arts and Sciences. Now, this, the significance of the title is a double entendre to my thinking. I mean, he's talking in particular about establishing a society, like a, an academy. Uh, on the other hand, he's talked, the principles he's laying out are what you would use for a nation uh, in order to have a productive uh, existence and a prosperous existence. And I have to confess, this is my favorite piece, not only of Leibniz, but of, of political philosophy in many respects, um, because of the introduction, which Leibniz comes out with before he gets into any detail of what such a society for the promotion of arts and sciences would do. Uh, he gives an epistemological, religious one might say, uh, ph philosophical discussion of the nature of man, his responsibilities to society. And from that, we derive what must be done uh, in order to sustain a productive society. So the purposes that, to guide the formation um, start right off with the duty of mankind who is endowed with the image of God, quote, is to be used as instruments for the glory of God and what is the same thing for the common good and for the nourishment, ease of labor, comfort, instruction, and enlightenment of their fellow man, for discovery, research, and improvement of creatures, according to the limitation of ability and knowledge. And he lays out, this I wouldn't have you read because it's, it's because I condensed it, um, but the, uh, in that first part, uh, what I didn't include was a very poetic description that he makes about how each individual is in the image of God. Effectively, that we are all mirrors who reflect uh, at different angles, reflecting different aspects of the image of God. And our duty is therefore to uh, utilize this image um, through our powers of reason and through our power. I mean, unlike many philosophers who say that the use of power is corruption, uh, Leibniz says, no, I mean, the, the best situation is if you're both reasonable and powerful. Uh, power doesn't necessarily corrupt you uh, if you use it according to reason. So you have, three ways that you can fulfill your duty. You can use good words, as orators, priests, and music musicians do. You can concentrate on good thoughts, be a natural scientist, uh, search out the perfections in nature and the arts, come up with discoveries uh, about how nature works and how it can benefit mankind. But then in the transition to the third, which he says is the absolute best, um, he uses a, a very poignant example. He said, what, you know, it's very important that you've got scientists exploring nature and coming up with new cures for diseases. But what's the good of coming up with the cure of diseases if then your social system doesn't allow those cures to be administered to people. Therefore, the highest form of service to your duty is to be a statesman and to carry out, to imitate, in effect, imitate God by creating a society based on these, on a 
quote, applying the discovered wonders of nature. Uh, I should read this something to medicine and mechanics, the comfort of life, sustenance of the poor, preservation of the common peace. Uh, it's really a beautiful, beautiful piece. And then he goes into a long section about the specific tasks of such a society. Um, and, you know, I give you just a few examples of that. It's much longer than this, uh, but it's very inclusive all the way from schooling, manufacturing, uh, and then hits some extremely important points, uh, which are advances, um, in my understanding, beyond Becker and others, which is that what you are going to promote in terms of physical economy is new technological inventions, utilizing always inexpensive fire in motion. Um, and these should be applied in all these areas, which are absolutely required for your society to advance. You see that telescopes, steel and iron works, and so forth. Remember, this is 1671. And he does actually get to work trying to produce some of those advances, not only with his theoretical work in terms of dynamics, uh, but also practically uh, collaborating, which he also started in Paris, in my understanding, uh, with Denis Papin on the uh, development of a steam engine, uh, water-powered steam engine, uh, which you see a graphic here. Now, uh, on the uh, on the other practical side, uh, Leibniz was quite serious about establishing academies, societies for the promotion of arts and sciences, and he acted very directly to doing that. Um, his uh, this Prussian Academy for Science for the Sciences uh, was established by some of his patrons in Berlin in 1700. I've, I've also seen it described as the Berlin Academy uh, uh, of Science. I'm not, I, I presume they're the same thing, um, just changing from one period of history to the other. Um, so he did uh, succeed in that one. He also proposed to Peter the Great, who, with whom he came in contact in some near the end of his life around 1710 uh, and who was extremely interested in Leibniz's uh, social and uh, technological ideas um, that he established a Russian Academy at St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences uh, and Peter the Great did it he just did it a couple of decades later, <laughs> um, not, not during Leibniz's lifetime. And that's a photo of that. And then he also uh, was a member of the Royal uh, Society in Vienna, the Habsburg Empire, um, and proposed that they establish an Academy of Arts and Sciences. But um, they were a bit slow on the uptake. He proposed it in 1713, and they did it in 1846 or seven. <laughs> um, so uh, they weren't so immediately receptive uh, to the idea. But you know, this, this is an idea he saw as extremely important everywhere. Now, this is my last section on how Leibniz came to America. Um, and there's a lot here you can find in Fidelio magazines in particular, uh, Graham Lowry's book and so forth. Uh, but I want to hit many of the areas just to make you familiar with them. Um, first you had, and we should not be overlooked, Leibniz's influence in England. He was actually in England 
uh, a couple times um, from when he was in Paris. Uh, this guy on the left is Jonathan Swift, whom Graham makes the case was a co-thinker of Leibniz operating in the courts and uh, political machinations in England. And this woman on the right is uh, Sophie Charlotte of Hanover, um, who was the a patron of Leibniz, who ended up after leaving Paris, going to Hanover uh, as a researcher uh, in their, uh, you know, working on law, working on genealogy, and he worked on law so effectively that he was actually the guy who established the Hanoverian uh, claim to the throne of England. Uh, and his patroness, Sophie here, was supposed to be the uh, monarch, uh, but unfortunately she died um, at the wrong time, and that didn't happen. But Leibniz was actively working for that to happen, uh, and there was a lot of activity uh, in England and awareness of his role and his potential uh, if she became Queen of England for him to be a leading. All right. So we go next to uh, take that terrible picture off. I couldn't, couldn't conceivably figure out what everything is in this emblem. <laughs> um, so you've got a very prominent figure he's in correspondence with effectively through the, the this network of scientific uh, discussion and collaboration. Uh, John Winthrop Jr., um, founder of Connecticut and the Saugus Iron Works. This happened very clearly, you can see, uh, 1676. He didn't live that all that long into Leibniz's period of, of active work, uh, but um, he actually does have scientific back and forth with Leibniz. And I wouldn't necessarily credit that influence with his one of his major accomplishments, which was the founder of these Saugus Iron Works, but, uh, but it's certainly coherent with the kind of political economy ideas that might have been discussed. We, I, we don't have the correspondence to my knowledge. Uh, if someone knows better, that would be great. Um, Saugus was extremely uh, advanced for ironworks at that time, uh, more advanced than what was going on in England. Now, one other major area heavily overlooked of input from Leibniz into the Americas is through uh, the Frankische Stiftung, which was a foundation by Hermann August Franke in Leipzig, in Halle, excuse me, close to Leipzig, Halle. Um, Franke was a close collaborator of Leibniz. Um, he established universities, he worked with Leibniz in terms of scientific uh, exploration of plants and uh, international uh, languages, international uh, collecting plants um, and medicines from all around the world, uh, and diplomacy um, for the interest of peace and collaboration among nations. So um, it was like a der little derivative center uh, of Leibnizian thought um, during this period. And it, the period being the end of the 17th century into the 18th century. And it, from this particular uh, 
institution comes also, the picture you see is a picture of an orphanage established by Franca, uh, which Ed and I had the benefit of visiting. Uh, Ed has an article about this connection in Fidelio. And he, this um, orphanage carried out a lot of the advanced ideas of the Camarilla school. For example, they educated poor children in all the arts and sciences. They didn't say you have to go to the workhouse and go into the fields or the mines or whatever because you're poor, you get an education, you can be educated. Uh, and there are signs, little aphorisms on the wall of this orphanage, which indicate discussions which the founders of the orphanage had with uh, it was one of the King Fredericks, right, who visited about how it was possible to educate these poor children, you know, educate their minds, right, not just educate them to do certain things. So this, uh, this center at Halle was very uh, instrumental in sending German immigration to the United States or to the American colonies. Uh, and it's, that story is much too long to go into right now, uh, but it had a very significant impact. Uh, the most prominent family involved, uh, all of whom came from Halle, was the Muhlenberg family, um, which went to Pennsylvania um, and as you probably know, as some of you may know, uh, the sons of the Henry Muhlenberg, the first guy who came, um, became a general, uh, Peter Muhlenberg, uh, the he first head of the Congress, um, and uh, a major botanist. Uh, so they were highly significant in, uh, in activity in the United States. And Franca was in close contact with Boston, uh, specifically Cotton Mather. There's a long correspondence uh, between Franca and, and uh, Cotton Mather, including on those orphan schools uh, and the need for education of the poor, uh, how they should be treated, um, and uh, that kind of thing. Another source of Leibnizian thought came also through Pennsylvania, James Logan, secretary to William Penn. Uh, there are stories that William Penn himself met Leibniz. I don't know whether that's, I, I've never seen that totally pinned down, uh, but Logan was a major theoretical uh, thinker and he, came to Leibniz's defense uh, in the Newton and the calculus controversy, which the Royal Society launched, um, and was a significant proponent of Leibniz's approach to science and his approach to government. Uh, and that in itself is highly significant in the development of Benjamin Franklin. So you have two strains coming together with Benjamin Franklin. You've got the boss, of course, Franklin comes from Boston, Cotton Mather being one of his acknowledged mentors uh, in terms of thinking about the philosophy to do good. And you have Logan, whose home was a major center for meetings of Franklin's Junto and other institutions. And then you have Franklin himself, um, who picks up the, the idea on the importance of the growth of population, uh, a well uh, taken care of population, well nourished population for uh, a sign of health of your economy. Uh, his major document is in 1851, Observations on the concerning the increase in mankind, which stresses the importance of manufacturing. Um, and uh, the, uh, and that 
is very coherent with what that camera school that we've been discussing. Uh, he also, Franklin, uh, took a famous trip to Germany in the uh, 1760s, I think 1766, uh, where he received a book of, uh, he received a copy of Leibniz's refutation of Locke. So he, he had a direct relationship uh, to proponents of Leibniz at that time, uh, as well as these perhaps more indirect influence of the ideas. And the last person I would go to is Vettel, whom I mentioned before. This is his major book. It was probably the most cited law book in the United States up into the 19, well into the 19th century. It's generally seen as basic as on the law of nations, um, but it is a soup to nuts discussion of how you organize your society for the greater good of mankind. And I'll give you the outline of that, his principles of good government. Um, number one, you provide the necessities, ensuring employment, all useful and necessary professions, developing agriculture and the food supply, readily in commerce, ensuring transport and sovereign control of money being the major ones. Number two, procure the true happiness of the nation. And again, we have this theme of happiness linked to, as Leibniz said, this sense of your obligation to do good. And Leibniz insisted that what makes you happy is when you fulfill your nature as a creature of God who creates and cares for his fellow man. Um, and this is the quote. And again, stressing this essential requirement for education. And then lastly, fortify against external attacks. Um, which is obviously essential for sovereignty. <laughs> I don't think one can argue about that. Now, those three elements are ones that I've pointed out previously uh, are also reflected in, in Hamilton's uh, report on manufacturers. And the happiness theme, which we've seen develop through this entire school, um, is clearly comes for, through in the shocking reality that the Declaration of Independence does not say life, liberty, and property, but the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and I'm sure you guys has, have discussed this before, um, and I'm not going to go through a great deal about that, but this obviously was no mistake. <laughs> was no turn of phrase, uh, but the bowing to a school of development, uh, which we've seen over the last hour. And the influence on Hamilton um, can come from many different areas, can come from the Leibnizians in England, uh, Colbert, uh, and the French reflection there, and Vettel, uh, Forrest MacDonald having argued strongly that Hamilton, who he says read Vettel at least in 1782, uh, perhaps earlier, um, really began to rethink his somewhat cynical uh, adoption of a human view of how human society should be organized and uh, take up the Vettel outlook, which we've just summarized.
And if you look at the summary of what the key elements of the American system, which I presented in that class, I think you again also see the sense of government responsibility for uh, areas that the cameraless school had been developing over the previous centuries. But here in the United States, um, the government came to power, which was committed to that. And Hamilton himself had a surprising emphasis on happiness. Uh, this was pointed out um, in a, a very nice blog called Statutes and Stories by a, a member of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society who goes back and he's a lawyer, uh, goes back and looks at how the law reflected certain critical elements and fights about laws, certain critical elements of uh, the American system. He doesn't use American system, but uh, the thinking of Hamilton and Washington. So he points out uh, in a recent post that, uh, that Hamilton's very infamous speech at the Constitutional Convention, which everyone attacks him for, um, because it was so strongly sent for centralization, uh, that he was, that Madison said he was continually, at least three times, referring to the need for the happiness of the population. And then in the, uh, this particular fellow, uh, who writes this blog, said that uh, has a thesis that Hamilton was the person who wrote the cover letter which George Washington sent out after the Constitutional Convention, uh, which went to the Congress and to the states uh, outlining how they should proceed uh, to adopt it uh, through these state conventions and so forth. Uh, and he believes that particularly this use of the word happiness uh, is a signal that is a signature, in a sense, that Hamilton was uh, the author of this, uh, of this letter. Because Hamilton believed that it was not quite reasonably uh, that it was not sufficient to have freedom from the evil of the British Empire, we had to secure the future. And that involved securing the happiness of the American population uh, through a proper political economy. And if you want to get more about that, uh, if any of you have not read my book, I would encourage you to do so. I think it's a good introduction to these ideas uh, as they are reflected in Hamilton. Uh, or you can write to me by the blog. Um, and thank you very much. I'm sorry for the bloopers. We'll have a, a director's cut of this class <laughs> for those who want to see the bloopers. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Nancy. And all the, the links to your book to purchase it will be also in the description box of this video. Uh, so people can take a look at that. It's a wonderful book. It's a very short, dense read of about 200 pages or so. Um, very essential knowledge about Hamilton and the suppressed forgotten school of, of political economy that you so eloquently went through. And before I just uh, pose a couple or call upon a couple of people, I just want to say again, thank you for really breaking the shell open. A lot of us are weighted down by these cultural habits of thinking that we have to sort of make arguments between either communist versus laissez-faire capitalist uh, modalities of argument, which completely ignore the deeper uh, thrust of history and this, this real principled scientific moral art <laughs> of, of political economy. That, uh, that you went through, which goes so much more deeply than this 20th century Cold War garbage that we're being fed 
that you know <laughs> of either utilitarian or personal monetary pleasure based uh, worldview. So that's great. Um, the the first um, question that popped up. Um, you might have already kind of addressed it on happiness, uh, but Hugh, I don't know if you, you want to uh, maybe throw it out there and expand upon that, or, or are you satisfied with, with how Nancy addressed happiness? Well, she touched on it, but I'm still curious because the concept of happiness, I think, has shifted somewhat since it was first mentioned 200 years ago. So perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on what they meant then by happiness versus what we think now. Well... Specifically, Leibniz, I, I, I think I may actually have a book where Leibniz has a precise quote on that. <laughs> and, um, you, because, I mean, he, he calls it felicity, right? Felicity. But that's, you know, that's basically. I'll read you the beginning. Virtue is the habit of acting according to wisdom. It's necessary that practice accompany knowledge. Wisdom is the science of felicity, happiness. I, I, I'm saying felicity means happiness and is what must be studied above all else. Felicity, i.e. happiness, is a lasting state of pleasure, which can only be done when you are perfecting yourself and others, when you are improving, when you are acting for the common good. So their idea of happiness was intimately related with fulfilling your mission as a human being made in the image of the creator. You know, you aren't, people may say they're happy, <laughs> but that's a feeling state, a short-term feeling state, and it's not through happiness. They don't know what happiness is, right? Um, the current usage of this happiness index, as in my understanding, is very much this feel-good one. You know, it says, well, you know, the people in Africa are really happy without all these modern conveniences like electricity, you know? Before the, before the electric plants showed up, they were really happy, you know? with a simple life um, and uh, or worse than that, you know, uh, saying that other countries are happier than the United States, for example, and I'm sure that's true. I mean, I'm not saying none of their results are necessarily correct. I mean, it's definitely the case that just having more wealth doesn't make you more happy. <laughs> but their emphasis is on not ensuring that economic justice, social justice, and constant improvement and progress are being guaranteed to your population. Their emphasis is on how do people feel? Do they do they feel good to you know this this month you know or this year, uh, and uh, are they satisfied right with what they have? Um, and um, I I think that has been used to ignore absolutely crying needs you know for education, for electricity, for clean water, for, you know, for the, the basic uh, improvements that this planet so definite, so desperately needs. Right. Thanks. Yeah, and on that note, for people who, I archive.org is a really wonderful um, internet resource with a lot of original writings that are, for, that are available for free. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that Benjamin Franklin acquired in Germany, I believe, was the New Essays on Human Understanding by right. Leibniz, right, from uh, Kistner. And in that book, which was a, a much more widely read book back then than people realize, Leibniz uh, directly tackles the John Locke uh, idea of the soul of happiness, of government, of everything. Um, and he writes in the form of a platonic dialogue um, against John Locke's Essays on Human Understanding. 
Um, so you could really see by reading something like that, it, it's a good thing to, uh, to sit down and really work through some sort of material like that to really appreciate these two different competing ideas of happiness, one being oligarchical and the other one being what Nancy's been going through uh, from Leibniz's own uh, line of reasoning, which had direct influence on these two opposing schools within the un United States, which again, thanks to your work and, and Ed's work on a lot of this material, Nancy, it's, uh, it's much more clear in my mind. Um, we have another question from uh, Ryan. It's a multifaceted question. So Ryan, I, Nancy doesn't have too much time. So if you could condense uh, your question concisely, that would be great. Sounds good. Uh, the thing I'm, I might ask and pose another question. Uh, so the, the qu my question uh, revolves around the relationship between culture and economic activity. So culture being seen as the the moral, uh, as a moral intellectual uh, uh, type of thing. I don't think it's a it's a causal re relationships, and there might be many different factors that enter into that. So, do you mind just elaborating a bit more on the relationship between economic productivity and uh, culture as seen on its uh, moral framework? Well. I, I'm trying to think about how I should, um, and I tried to, to deal with that in, um, as I went along, I thought um, that your, your cultural framework of your society is going to have everything to do with what your physical economic policy is going to be um, and also how it's going to be received, right? Um, I mean, you can have a uh, society where the, for the sake of argument, because we're talking about cameralism was generally happened when there were princes, right? Where your prince has a you know, great policy for economic advancement, but your population uh, believes that machines come from the devil, right? Or something like that. Uh, so uh, a mismatch, um, which is I think one reason why there was so much stress on education in the cameraless school uh, of getting people to be uh, able and and to to study and become aware of what uh, the world was actually like but uh, and and what alternate ideas there were to what what they were accustomed to in their day-to-day -day life. Um, the, I think that you can't, I mean, I've made the argument in terms of the United States where uh, we clearly had a, well, you could make the argument today. If your culture, if the dominant culture, when we started, uh, political activity, when I started political activity, uh, the idea of, of prioritizing um, saving nature as opposed to saving people, and I know it doesn't have to be one or the other, but people do tend to look at it that way, um, was called the counterculture. Today it's the culture, right? Um, that, uh, that, and, and that cultural idea is a, a hindrance <laughs> to being able to do what's necessary to advance the happiness of our population as a whole. Take the question of nuclear power, right? If your culture has indoctrinated people from a very young age to say that 
nuclear power is evil, um, then that, you know, is a major block to being able to carry out the right policy to improve people's lives, which would be greatly improved if they didn't have a coal plant or they didn't have, you know, uh, 85 acres of solar panels, you know, in their backyard. So, um, that, that's a, a, that's my stab at trying to answer your question. I hope that helps some. Thank you. All right, I, I think that, <clears throat> I think that that was it for now. I, I know that um, somebody under Galaxy Tab A had a question, I, I guess that was Quan. Quan, did you have a thought or a question or was that just a, a private uh, commentary? Yeah, that's right. Uh, for today, uh, I changed first name to Galaxy. So that's a, it's much more universal <laughs> name. <laughs> so uh, uh, yes, I have a comment plus a question to Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Nancy. How are you? Fine. Thanks how are for you? your presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your excellent presentation. So I just want to say that uh, cameralism is possible uh, even without uh, princes, because uh, as you certainly know, uh, Sun Yat-sen devised a plan for China's development more than a century ago. And that plan was inspired by Henry Carey, the economic advisor to President Abraham Lincoln and also chief of the American School of Economy. And what uh, the BRI project nowadays in China, uh, led by President Xi Jinping and the CPC, is more or less the practical realization on the economic and political dimension of the plan devised by Sun Yat-sen a century ago. Well, I, I definitely agree that cameralism doesn't require a prince. I was simply answering that question in the historical perspective. I mean, the, uh, that's not what the individuals who were influenced by uh, Leibniz here on this side of the Atlantic thought they certainly were interested in the Republic. And so, uh, of course, people did conceive of republics with princes as well. But um, that's uh, definitely the case. And, and yes, the history you mentioned is my understanding of the history as well in terms of Sun Yat-sen. Um, I remember reading his, uh, what he wrote, what, in 1922 or something? He wrote a, a major book on the development, which outlined the development of railroads throughout China. Uh, which was really prophetic, right? In terms of what yeah. needed to be done. Um, so, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, I, I would say it, it was a planning, but it was waiting for Xi Jinping to, and the CP to do it in reality. And I would say that uh, just for a kind of joke, but at the same time, it's serious. The chamber, the camera nowadays in, in China is the permanent committee of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the seven to 10 members who are truly ruling China, if I may say so. You're, you're dealing with a non-expert. You can't draw me out to talk much about that. I listen to you. Oh, <laughs> that's too much. Uh, that's too much, Nancy. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, you have to qualify yourself, you know. <laughs> I think I think Juan will actually be uh, delivering uh, an upcoming presentation where he'll be expanding a little bit on this in uh, in some weeks' time. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. And um, yeah, no, indeed, the, it, it's so important to have access to the right historical dynamics and idea content in order to begin navigating through the world uh, that is so crisis-ridden today and it's so confused. And there's so many good people that want to have a future that want to be happy, but because they're, they're not privy, they don't have access to 
uh, these broader ideas that have shaped so much of our history, they're largely incapable of generating the creative solutions needed to have that happiness that they so desire and that future and security that they so desire. So thank you, Nancy, so much for situating that and creating Thank you. I think I'm going to sign off now. Yeah, of course. No, okay. Course. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Have a good vacation. Hmm? I hope thank you really, I hope you enjoyed it. It was, as I said, I, I thank Matt for having, you know, allowing me to do it. I'd never read Sarah before I, in the original. I had taken it on authority of friends. Now I read it myself, you know, uh, and um, this revival is, I think somewhat interesting, you know, it's not being used for Malthusian purposes. It's being used to try to get a moral compass in the, in political economy. And I think we, we clearly need that. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Greetings from Germany. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank yes. You. <laughs> My head thank is exploding. That. My yeah, head that is that exploding. You give us the, the roots of a great uh, America. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Bye. Cheers. Bye, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.